How's it going everybody? Andrew Robinson here back at it with another Max MSP tutorial. In this video we are going to talk about two very useful jitter objects that work together. That is the jit.scissors object and the jit.glue object. Jit.scissors will take your video plane and it's going to cut it up into little parts. Jit.glue is going to take those little parts and it's going to stick them all back together. Uh, which is very useful for a lot of different reasons, uh, both aesthetically and for a really neat trick I'm going to show today uh, that harks back to an older video I made about motion frame differencing and taking the amount of motion as a trigger for certain things. So we're going to take a look at that too. Let's just jump right into it, shall we? First things first, jit.scissors. It's got two attributes that we need to pay attention to. That is the at columns three at rows two. That is how you tell the jit.scissors object how you want to cut the video plane up. And you can see it's cut up exactly like that. If we just take these uh, three windows and we move them down, you'll see uh, it actually lines up pretty well with this video image above here. We have three columns that we've cut it into and then two rows. So then that's just taken a cut right down the middle. And you see out of each outlet of the jit.scissors object, it's attached into each of these P windows. So that is how we are getting that part of the window. And this kind of makes sense. Um, if we change the rows to three, we're gonna get a whole bunch of extra outlets. You can see the way it's being cut has been uh, changed now because the way the dimension size is different. And if we just copy these and patch in some more patch cores, you'll see we will actually complete the window once again. And now with three columns in three rows. Um, and jit.glue is exactly the same way. It's just rather than creating outlets, it creates inlets for us to stick things together, which is pretty cool. So let's go back to our original max file. Let's create a jit.world object. So we have a video plane to see things in. We're gonna say at floating one, so it floats. We're gonna say at FSA one, so we have full screen anti-aliasing and FS menu bar zero, so it's no menu bar when we go full screen. Good settings to always start with. We're gonna create a toggle by pressing T, patch it in, lock our patch, uh, click it, and now our jit.world is rendering. And so we can do things. We're gonna create a jit.gl video plane at transform reset two, so it reaches the edge of the window. Uh, and now we have a vi video plane with inner world to see things. We are almost all set up to go. We're just gonna use the jit.grab object so we can use our webcam to do stuff with. Um, I'm gonna also say jit.dimmap invert one, so we flip it on the X axis and it just makes more sense for me to look at myself that way. We're gonna send the open message to the grab object. It's gonna turn our webcam on. You should see the light come on on your computer. If you did that, just make sure to lock the patch and click open. Um, and then we need to define uh, how we're gonna cut this up. So I'm just gonna say four columns and we get our four outlets and if we patch the jit.dim map into that and we patch that into the video plane you'll see we get that uh first column and it's all stretched out so one that's just kind of cool if you you know want to use this uh weird effect for something in some way where it's all like stretched and uh everything but if you want to try and piece this back together you're just going to say at uh columns four for the jit.glue object two and then we're going to patch the first inlet into the first or the first outlet into the first inlet and you'll see now it's more appropriate we have that one first column in that first column spot um and the rest is blank because nothing's patched in yet so we could go ahead and patch the rest of these together if we wanted to and now we have stuck our image back together completely so that's pretty cool and you could have a lot of fun with this like if you wanted this one to be first you could do that maybe that one's last this one could be second and that's third and uh now everything's like you know broken and doesn't make sense and this could all you know dynamically flip around so you could get really creative and fun with that and you know the more columns and rows you define the more ways you could mess with it in that way um just keep in mind it is hard to do things dynamically in terms of changing numbers because we are using a predefined number of outlets and inlets for this so just that makes it a little bit more difficult to work with if uh, if you were trying to get 
really fancy with it. But this this totally works, and you can have gates flipping these around. Um, but we're not doing that today. We are actually moving on to something else. What I want to do is I want to have each of these columns um, when there's a certain amount of motion moved in that column, it's going to trigger uh, an audio effect to play. So you have a very specific audio sample playing for a very specific portion of the video. This could be useful for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I'm going to delete these patch cords. I'm going to patch myself back together normally there. And there we go. That's looking right. Um, and now we are going to use the frame differencing technique that we talked about in a very, very old video. Um, this technique is super useful. It's one of the first things I learned and it's about taking motion and making that interactive. So to do this, we need to first reduce our video plane down to a black and white image. And I am just going to take this patch cord real fast and we're gonna patch it over here so we can see that. And it's that first column image stretched out again, but now it's black and white. Um, and now we are going to use the trigger object and we're gonna say list list. So we're gonna have one list output here and then the same exact list output the next frame immediately after. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the absolute difference of these values, uh, which will give us, you know, change. Cause if it was the same exact frame, uh, everything's gonna subtract evenly and we're gonna get a black image. But if it's a different frame, then we'll see only that difference. And you'll see it works uh, because the only thing where stuff is moving is what shows up in that outline. And you see uh, uh, it's a little bit flashy and glitchy, sort of. Um, so to remedy that, we can use the jit.change object. And I'm going to go ahead and put it up here. Uh, so that way it is applied before we even slice things up. And there you go. Now you see that that outline, which is our motion and our change and uh, motion, uh, is a little bit more stable. So with that, we now need to extract the information from this, which we can do using the jit.3m object. Because uh, if we attach our jit.abs different into this object out of this outlet right here, we are going to get the mean value of all these pixels summed up, uh, which is super helpful in this case because that means the more motion there is, the higher that value is because the more pixels there are. So we can actually now use this value as like a motion control value, which is exactly what we're about to do. Um, but we're going to do it uh, by using a threshold. So I'm gonna say if our motion goes above a certain value. Um, this is sort of arbitrary. Uh, you can see uh, as I'm moving very slowly, it's around like five, six, but if I move fast, it spikes up above 10. So that's why I said must be greater than or equal to 10. So if this motion value goes above 10, we're going to get a one out of this outlet, which I am going to use to trigger a sound effect. Now, if you click this icon over here, in the max window, uh, it's gonna come up with some sound files. And I have a few more than you might, uh, depending on what your max folders look like um, on your computer. Um, but there are some default so sounds that definitely just come with max. So I'm gonna use those in this case. The first one I'm going to use is drum loop. And I'm just gonna drag and drop that into the patch. And we now have this playlist object that has that sound file in it. So we're going to patch this into there. Uh, and so basically, if this value is true, uh, which is, you know, when the motion value is greater than 10, this one is going to come out of this patch cord, and that's going to tell this object to play this sound just like that. All we got to do to finish this off is create an easy deck object so we can hear the sound uh, by routing it to our speakers. So if I go above 10, there we go, it's playing the sound, and that's pretty sweet. Um, now, obviously, we have some issues. I, maybe you might like that sound, um, but what's happening right now is as soon as I pass above 10, that one is actually constantly coming out, which is causing this sound to re-trigger over and over. So if we want to uh, fix that situation, we just got to do the same thing we did up here. We need a change object to filter out the repetition of, of values. So um, if a one passes through this patch cord, 
it's going to let that first one pass, but then if it gets another one, it's not going to let that one pass. Um, and it basically won't until we get a different value. So if that zero comes through when this isn't true, that'll tell this to stop, and that'll also reset the change to allow for the next one to come through. Um, so now it's working a little bit better. It's not re-triggering, but we still are only sort of getting that first kind of quick snippet of the sound. And that's because uh, I pass above the threshold and then immediately dip back down and then immediately dip back up. Um, so that doesn't, you know, work as well for that this effect, uh, just because we're still re-triggering it pretty quickly. So we're going to use an object called route pass, which uh, honestly is another object that deserves its own tutorial video. Route pass you, is very similar to the route object. You're going to define an argument for the inlet to look for. So I said one, so it's going to anything that comes into this inlet, if it has a one, whatever comes after it, is going to be filtered out this outlet. Um, but with route pass, it will pass the whole message, including that one. So this seems kind of confusing. Uh, let me just show you, as that will actually make it make a lot more sense. We're gonna patch the patch cord of the change object into the route pass, and we're gonna patch this into a message box real fast. And uh, when I uh, move, really fast you see this one has come out through this outlet um, but not the zero and that's because it's only letting the route the route pass is only letting this one pass through the zero actually has come out of this outlet which um, is if it doesn't match so we uh, don't want the zero actually to filter out and trigger this object to turn off we only want that one to come through and turn, tell it to turn on. So now if I pass the motion, there we go. Even though I'm making more motion, we, or I'm not making motion, we still have the sound playing. Um, so now, now that we've got the whole sound to trigger and play, we just need to copy and paste all of this over for each one of these columns and then swap out these sounds. So that's super easy. I'm gonna move that in here. And we're gonna move this down here, slide this over, just clean some stuff up. Um, and we're just gonna slide that like right there. That should be okay, honestly. And then I'm just gonna copy and paste that, which I did by holding down the option key on my keyboard and dragging over as everything was highlighted. And so we're gonna take the second column now, we're gonna patch that into there. Uh, it's gonna trigger and that's perfect. And now we just need to change out the audio sample. Let's do clap instead of drum loop. So now the first column is our drum loop and the second column is the clap. That's pretty fun. Um, and also works pretty perfectly uh, already. So there we go, let's just keep moving right along. We're gonna copy this over. We're gonna patch this one into this uh, object. It's gonna activate and we just need to find another audio sound. Let's do something interesting. Um, is that you? Sure. Is that you? So yeah, now it's our third column that's triggering that one to play which is pretty fun. Uh, and we just have one more column to go to um, have our completed set. Statue. And we're gonna use one more audio sample. Um, let's do cello, sure. Oops, and I dragged it into the wrong spot, so I'm just gonna delete that real fast. We're gonna drag this down just so it's set up easier. There we go. And then we have a cello sound for the last column. So that works great. Um, and that's going to trigger a lot. So I'm going to mute my audio really fast. Um, 
So that is actually working really well. The only thing I think is kind of an issue is when we do this, we can't really tell which column we're in to trigger that sound. It would be more helpful if we could see what we're doing that way. So we're going to try and set that up really quick. Um, and all we have to do is switch between, I guess, the black and white look or this color look, depending on which one is the active column. So that actually is not that hard to do. Um, we're just going to use the switch object and we are going to have the the regular uh, camera color be the first inlet and let's uh, make the RGB to Luma the second inlet. Now one thing that we need to be aware of as we do this so that it doesn't uh, start breaking is that our RGB to Luma is a one plane matrix. Um, and this needs a, a full four plane matrix to be effective because that I think is what we are sending it in the first place. Um, so we're going to easily fix this situation by saying uh, JIT matrix for char 1280 by uh, 960, which I think is my webcam dimension size. Um, and if we just slide that in here, uh, at this spot, then our matrix will go back from being a one plane when we do the black and white image to a four plane. Um, and that's just a little technical detail that this is going to need the four planes instead of that one plane, but that's how you fix that. So now we just need to switch back and forth between this, which uh, we can do again with this motion threshold value. So it's a one when it's true and a zero when it's false. If we just add one to that uh, output, we're going to get a one or a two, which is conveniently what we need for the switch. Uh, it's now set to one because this is less than 10, which means we have this first inlet open, which is our regular view. But if we go above the motion threshold, you see it flips to black and white, uh, which means that that is true and we are triggering the sound to play. So sweet, pretty easy. And now we just need to copy all of this over again for each column. This I will admit is kind of the struggle with JIT.scissors and columns. It's a lot of patching uh, patch cords together and like copying and pasting things, which um, can be a struggle and can be kind of confusing and messy. Um, but this object is still very valuable for uh, beginners and learning how these things work um, and just doing things like this really quickly where you know you don't need um, like you know 50 squares you just need four and it's it makes it a lot easier um, so we're going to just quickly finish this up and I'm actually gonna take from the change object instead I think that just makes a little bit more sense um, and we are going to do, do, do. So yeah, like I said, it's a little bit messy because we now have all these extra patch cords. Um, but that's it, this works. So if we turn the sound back on, we can now hear and see which column we're activating. And we've created an amazing musical instrument just like that. This is uh, pretty fun, and you can have these sounds be anything you want. Um, and the more you know, the more you can do with it. So I hope that video is pretty clear. I hope you guys learned something pretty interesting about how JIT.scissors and glue can work and the ways we can use that to do some really cool things like area specific sound tr uh, sample triggers. Um, yeah, uh, if you guys did find this video helpful, please uh, remember to like and subscribe because that's how I know you guys found this helpful and how I know you guys learned something. Um, and if anybody has any comments or questions, please feel free to leave that in the section down below. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.